Hey, welcome everybody. Great to have you here today. I want to welcome everybody, whether you are inside, outside, or watching online, uh, however you may be watching, listening, being a part of this. We're so glad uh, that you are here. And we are uh, wrapping up this series today, but before I get into that, let me tell you about something that's coming up here uh, in just a few months, and that is I'm taking a team over to Israel again for a tour. And it is an incredible journey that is uh, something that will change your life forever. And I want to invite you to come with us. So uh, take a look at this video. I'm standing right now on Masada, which is a hill right outside of the Dead Sea. It's an epic archaeological discovery about a battle that took place uh, soon after the destruction of Jerusalem. Behind me is the Dead Sea, and I'm with a tour right now, and we're getting ready to go soak in the Dead Sea for fun and medicinal reasons as well. And I just want to invite you to join us next time that we come. Uh, it is an investment that you will not soon forget and you will cherish for the rest of your life. You'll read the Bible like you've never read it before. It will come alive to you. You'll understand it and you'll have a great time making new friends on this incredible trip. Okay, so for those of you that have been, you know how amazing this trip is. And for those of you that have thought, ah, maybe we should go, you need to go, okay? So I'm going to be out in the lobby as soon as we're done here answering any questions that you might have. Number one question people want to ask is, is it safe? Yes, it's incredibly safe. There are people walking around with M16s. You are fine, okay? <laughs> So, um, I mean, seriously, all major religions feel like this is their piece of property, so they're all guarding it. So you're incredibly safe there. I've never felt, uh, I felt safer there than I have uh, in some places here uh, in Los Angeles, and I think that goes without saying. So anyway, it is an unbelievable experience. Make sure that you check it out, rlc.is slash Israel, and I'd love, for you to have, I'd love for you to have that opportunity and uh, just to hang out with you. It'd be a lot of fun. Okay, so today we are wrapping up uh, our series uh, about this idea of mastering our mind and how our mind is just, it's such a mess at times. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, the mind really is a battlefield. I don't care what Pat Benatar said, it is the mind that is the battlefield. You all are my people because you laughed at that. All right. The mind is a battlefield and we're always struggling with this and wrestling with this. And we've been talking about strongholds and how to get a hold on these kind of things and to renew our minds. And if you've missed any of the first four parts of this series, make sure that you go back and listen to them or watch them and dive into that. And we've also got some extra stuff for you. One of those is our, our daily scriptures. Many of you have signed up for these right there on the app. Just go to the RLC app. You're going to see right there, alerts, hit that, and you can be notified with a daily scripture we'll send you every day that you can meditate on. And as if that's not enough, let me recommend this great book uh, by this pastor by the name of Craig Rochelle. It's called Winning the War in Your Mind. It is a great biblically-based book. I highly recommend it. It is awesome. Another thing that may help you, we did a series back in 2020 uh, called Anxious for Nothing. It was a really fun series, and we unpacked a verse that we're going to talk about here in just a minute over the course of four weeks, and you can check that out. That's also on our app. And the last thing, and this is brand new, hot off the press, just dropped today, our our incredible worship team, uh, RLCM, Real Life Church Music, has released Meditations Part 1. And you can go to Spotify or Apple Music, and you can listen to these for free. And they are daily meditations for you to help you focus in on what God is saying to you. And they're scripturally based, and they have our great music with it as well. So you're going to want to check that out, RLCM Meditations, and check that out on Spotify, uh, the RLC app or Apple Music, that would be just great. Okay, so today, we're going to kind of land the plane with this series by talking about the issue that every single one of us wrestle with the most, and that is our obsession with worry. All of us struggle at times with worry, some of us more than others. 
And this is our premise we've been talking through through this entire series, and that is your life is always moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. Now, I want to put up two images here, and this is, I tell my kids this all the time, and I've told you this a few times, and I want you to just picture these two creatures right here. This is a, a buzzard, okay, and this over here is a hummingbird. Both of these spend their day looking for one thing. The hummingbird is looking for something sweet, and the buzzard is looking for something dead. And they both find what they're looking for. Every single day, these two creatures find what it is they're looking for. So here's my question for you. Who are you more like? Okay, I'm just talking about you, not the person you're sitting sitting next to, not your spouse, but what are you constantly in your mind looking for? Is it the positive? Is it the negative? Are you looking for something sweet or something dead? Many of us struggle with buzzard-like thinking. Now, let me just in a moment of just pure confession to you, and for those of you that have been around here for a long time, you've heard me talk about this before, but this is an issue near and dear to my heart because I am a habitual worrier, okay? There we go. Now, I know I might seem happy-go-lucky and upbeat and everything's fine, but in my mind, I'm waiting for it all to fall apart, okay? I know, oh, it's a good day. Oh, something's bound to go wrong. Here we go, you know? Even when the Chiefs won the Super Bowl, oh, this will never last. And it didn't, you know? So there's this constant, it's going to get worse, it's going to get worse kind of mentality. And I know I'm not alone. In fact, for, for me, this is something I've struggled with for a long time. I've actually had an ulcer before because of worry. And you might think, well, I've had that before. I've got that right now. What's the big deal? I had it in second grade. So there you go. Top that one. I was really stressed about division. Okay, it was a big problem. Um, But truthfully, all growing up, I just kind of always was a little bit unsettled, a little bit nervous, and and had these struggles with worry and anxiety. And I worried about my grades. I worried about homework. I worried about friends. I worried about sports. I worried about getting in trouble. Then I got into junior high. And I worried about a kid by the name of Daryl. And Daryl was a bully. And Daryl would always find me during lunchtime. And whether it was knock my tray over or make fun of me for something, I was just constantly worried about Daryl. In fact, that's not even his name. I fear he's listening right now and may be here. And so... (laughs) I don't want to call him out, okay, for fear he'll come for me. So this is something that a lot of us have wrestled with in our life. We've worried about these kind of things. We've grown up with this kind of stuff. And I remember being a kid thinking, if I could just be the age of my parents, surely they don't worry about anything. They don't worry about getting in trouble. They don't worry about grades. They don't worry about homework. I just assumed all adults had no worries. Well, then I became an adult, and I thought, whoa, we got a whole nother set of worries I never thought about before. And then I became a parent. Oh, there's a whole nother set of worries. And if you're like me, this is just something that constantly comes to live in your mind. Now, the Bible actually talks a lot about this. In fact, the Bible tells us that we shouldn't worry. In fact, take a look at this uh, phrase here that Jesus said. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Jesus does not say, let your hearts be troubled. You should really stress about things. You should really worry because you need to assume that things are going to get worse. That way, when they don't, you'll be pleasantly surprised. He doesn't say that at all. Think about when the angel showed up to declare that, 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 that Jesus was coming to earth. He did not say, glory to God in the highest, stress and anxiety on the earth. No, it said this, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to everyone. And the Apostle Paul, when he wrote a letter to the, one of the first churches that was ever established, he decides to talk about worry. Now think about that. Even back then, they dealt with it, to which many of us would say, what did he have to worry about? I mean, we have, uh, you know, global issues going on right now. They didn't even know what was going on on the other side of the world. We have 24-hour news cycles telling us how bad the world is. They didn't even know about that. We have social media reminding us who we're not and what we're missing out on. He didn't have any of that. But yet, the Apostle Paul talked about worry from a prison cell while he was literally waiting to be executed. And it's in this moment that he decides to talk 
about the peace of God. Now, every single one of us has looked for somebody to give us a little bit of influence and impact as to how we can reduce our worries and increase our happiness and somehow find peace and move from a buzzard to a hummingbird. And we have tried positive thinking. We have tried self-talk. We put little stickers around our, our room and we put bumper stickers on our car, which is funny to me because we can't read them. They're behind us. But anyway, we have all these little sayings and things on our phone to try to help us calm down. But could I encourage you to take a listen to what the Apostle Paul had to say? Because this was a guy that lived every single day with the threat of death. And this is what he has learned about worry. Take a look at what he says right here. Do not be anxious about anything. Now let's stop here for just a second. Because I know that that may sound incredibly insensitive to some of you. You've got real issues going on right now. You've got real problems that you're facing right now. And you just hate it when somebody comes up to you and says, you'll be okay. I mean, when you're frustrated about your job and somebody says, oh, it'll be fine. Everything happens for a reason. Don't you just want to smack them in the face? You know, in the loving name of Jesus, of course, you know, and, and then pray for them. You just, you're just sick of it. And you know why that is? Because they don't feel the same level of stress you do about that. Because they don't care about your job like you do. They don't care about your kids like you do. They don't care about your financial picture like you do. It is the most pressing thing on your life. And of course, they're not going to understand. None of us understand each other's stresses and worries. Yet the Apostle Paul says here, I'm telling you, you do not need to be anxious about these things. You do not need to stress about these things. And he's not saying, just don't worry, be happy. He's not saying, just forget it all, and there is no reason to even be concerned. He's just saying, that this is not the point of life. And this is a guy that's literally waiting for somebody to come and chop his head off. If anybody's going to be anxious, it's him. And he says, you know what? Don't be anxious about anything. Okay, Paul, why? What should we do? He says, glad you asked. Here's what he says to do. Do not be anxious about anything, but in, let's say these bold words together, in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your request to God. The Apostle Paul, who is literally waiting to die, is telling us, you can talk to God about this. You can literally find peace by praying to God. Now, let me just unpack this for a little bit. Because for most of us, when we think about prayer, it is the last resort. I mean, most of us tend to think, I don't want to bother God with this. He's got enough stuff going on. My little problem is not an issue. I'll go to him when it's a really big deal, like it's a break glass in case of emergency. It's almost like we view God like our dad who's watching football. Don't interrupt him. Okay, let's just wait till at least a commercial or his team scores. We're not going to bother God. And Paul says in every situation, the big and the small, the critical and the not so critical. I want you to bring your requests to God. And this is a guy that's been doing it for years. He's been bringing his requests to God, and he has found it has brought him peace. Now, right there, we begin to discover that the battle for our mind is won through prayer. This entire series of Mastermind has been designed to help you understand one thing. The way you change your thoughts and thus your life is through prayer. Prayer is the most important thing in your life. And I know you're thinking, I don't know how to do that. I leave that up to the professionals. I can't really do that. And I, I get it. When I go and hang out with other people or my wife and I go have dinner with somebody and it's time, the food comes out and we kind of look around and there's like a, a hierarchy. People start figuring out, okay, yeah, you're my small group leader and you taught my kids, but you're the pastor. You should pray, okay? And so like I've got some kind of, you know, hotline to God. Um, we can all talk to God. 
We can all have this conversation with God. I don't get through to him any more than you can. And what Paul is going to do is he's going to tell you how. And this is so helpful for all of us that are wrestling with not just worry, but what do we do with it? So he gives us these words. The first one is, he says, by prayer and petition, which literally means you are seeking, you are asking, you are pleading with God. Jesus tells this parable one time about a woman that, that, that came to Jesus and kept asking and asking and asking until she finally got what it was that she needed. And here's what Jesus is saying through that prayer and what Paul is saying through this word petition, and that is pray and do not give up. Now, many of us have seen out in a parking lot somewhere here in California a group of people collecting signatures for a petition to stop or start something or elect someone or get somebody recalled. And maybe you've signed, maybe you haven't. That is a petition. They are begging for change. And that's what God is saying here. He's saying, I want you to do that with me. And you think, why would you want me to beg? I'm not saying beg. I want you to keep asking because it's going to do something for you. And then he says, here's the way I want you to do it. I want you to do it with thanksgiving. I mean, this is a gratitude mindset. This is not a, you've done nothing for me lately, so it's about time you show yourself. This is a, God, I recognize all you've already given me. I recognize that some of the things I'm asking for seem like extras and icing and comfort, but the reality is I need this, and I'm coming to you, and I'm asking, but I am one that is grateful for all that you have done. And then he uses this other word. He says, present. I want you to present your requests to God. This doesn't sound like a very prayer word, does it? It literally means to reveal, like you're solving a mystery, like it's the last 10 minutes of Dateline, and we're putting all the pieces together, and I knew it was the husband that killed her. I mean, it's always the husband. So anyway, in that moment, it's solving a mystery. And Paul is saying, this is so much more than asking God to help you find your car keys or find a, a parking space or for them to call you back. I want you to reveal to God what you really want. And most of us, when we pray, we start out talking to God, and we don't even know what we really want. And Paul says, I want you to petition God so much with gratitude that you are presenting to him what it is you really, really want. God, I thought I wanted that person to call me back. But now I think what it is I really want is I want to know that I'm not rejected. And then I'm loved. God, I, I really want to be called back for that job. But you know what I think I really want? I just really want a job that is satisfying to my soul. Maybe that's not even this job. But God, that's what I really want. And I've noticed that the longer I spend in prayer, the more I'm even able to get to the root of what it is that I really want. And many times we are just living on the surface level of God, bless my food, help everybody to get to their destination safely, and help us to have a good day. And God is saying, oh, okay, 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 but what do you really want? Let's get to that, and let's deal with that, because that's what matters most. And when Paul says, don't be anxious about anything, but, but by prayer, I want you to bring your petitions before God. Here's what he says the result will be. This is so cool. Look at this. And the peace of God. It's like we forgot that we say these together. Okay, let's just, it's highlighted, friends. All right, let's try it again. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I bet I've read that a hundred times before I noticed what he's going to guard. We spend most of our time praying for God to guard our circumstances and God to guard our kids and God to guard a parking space 
and God to guard our calendar. And you know what he says he will guard? Your hearts and your minds. Your emotions and your rationale. In other words, not always going to give you what you want, but I will guard your heart and your mind if you pray. Here's why this is so important. Because prayer literally rewires your brain. I mean, this is true spiritually speaking, as we've just said. Not only does God hear our prayers, not only does he respond to our prayers, not only do we see God's hand move in our lives, in those moments we're able to see what he's already done, which brings about gratitude, but it literally changes the chemistry in your brain. In fact, Dr. Carolyn Leaf wrote this incredible book called Switch On Your Brain, and she talks about this concept. Uh, Take a look at this quote from her. She says, it has has been found that 12 minutes of daily focused prayer over an eight-week period can change the brain to such an extent. (laughs) It's like I was buffering right there. Did you catch that? Okay. That it can be measured on a brain scan. I mean, think about that for just a second. You start praying 12 minutes a day for an eight-week period of time, you literally change the chemistry of your brain. It changes the way you view things because you are shifting your mindset from a buzzard mentality to a hummingbird mentality. And this is so much more than just positive thinking. This is you aligning your thoughts with God's thoughts. This is you rewiring your brain to think the way that God thinks about your lives. Now, this is the way typically we deal with our worries. I've got a couple of boxes up here. I don't know if you notice that or not. And I brought with me a stack of cards. The cards represent our worries, okay? And this is kind of the way we start off. We've got a worry of of our kids, so we throw that in the God box. We've got a worry of a test coming up, so we throw that in the God box. We've got a worry that somebody won't call us back. We put that in there. We've got the job, okay? We throw that in there. We've got the government. Well, no one knows what to do with that. So we throw that over there, right? And so in this moment, we're, 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 we're trying, to, trying to figure out, God, can you handle this? But in that moment, after a period of time, we begin to think, God hasn't done anything. I don't know what to do. And so we take all those worries and we take them out of God's hands and we put them into our hands. And we think, I guess I got to do that. And the problem that you and I have is our God is too small. And our worry box for us is way too big. But what Paul is saying here is you don't interpret God through your circumstances. You interpret your circumstances through God. In other words, we need to switch these around to where God is bigger than ourselves and all of our problems and all of our worries. And we present them to God. With gratitude, he even hears us. With gratitude, he can even do something about it. And we begin to recognize, I don't have the ability to do this on my own. Now, that's the first step but I want to give you a few really practical things that will help you make that a reality in your life. Here's the first thing. Do what you can do. Okay? In other words, don't just pray that God will make you healthy while you eat nachos and milkshakes and say, God, you got to figure this one out, but here we go. Okay? You're going to have to do your part on this as well. Don't just pray for your big exam coming up this next week and say, well, you know what, God, you're you're on this. I'm going to go out and not study. There is something that you're going to have to do on this. That is what goes in the me box. You have to do what you can do. But then you got to give God what you can't. I can't heal that person. I can pray God will heal them, but I also know God might choose not to. I can't change anybody else. I can pray that God will change them, 
but they're going to have to be willing. I can't control everything that happens. That is the hardest thing for us to figure out. I cannot control everything that happens. But I can certainly ask God to have a part in that and for his peace to guard my heart and my mind regardless of whatever the outcome is. We give God what we can't do. And part of that is when we're laying awake in the middle of the night worried about something, let's just admit what we can't do. God, as much as I'm worried about this, I recognize I can do nothing about it. So I'm just going to let you have this. I've done what I can do. You take the rest. Which leads us to this last thing. You just have to eventually trust God no matter what. I mean, for those of us that battle with worry, and this is the struggle that I've been through, of recognizing there's only so much I can do. I can't control anything or anyone outside of me. And it's going to have to be a relationship with me talking to God to hand this over to him, for him to begin to just take charge of all of this, because I can't do this. And it is a choice that I have to make every single day. Learning how to break the power of worry in my life is not a one and done kind of thing. Pray to prayer, done. It is a daily struggle for me. It's like an addiction. And every day I got to wake up and say, hi, I'm Rusty. I'm a worrier. I'll call it concern, but it's worry. And what I'm doing in that moment is I'm taking even me and putting it in there. I can't do it. I'll work as hard as I can. I'll be as, as uh, smart as I possibly can. I'll do what I can do. But at the end of the day, there's only so much I can do. I got to trust God. And you got to trust God. Because trust and worry cannot coexist. You can trust God on some things and worry on the rest, but you won't be able to do them both simultaneously. You've got to learn how to get rid of, just like I have to daily learn how to get rid of this worry. So with that comes this. You need a plan. Okay? Don't just be motivated by what I have to say today. And you walk out of here and go, yeah, that's, that's something I really should do. And I'm going to start working on that. That means you're doing nothing. All right? You've got to have a plan as to what you're going to do. And for some of you, it's that 12-minute challenge. Like that 12 minutes for eight weeks is going to rewire your brain. Set the timer on your iPhone, and you just sit there, and you talk to God for 12 minutes. You're going to eventually start talking about the dog or the cat or whatever. That's fine. Keep the conversation going. Don't worry if you pray badly. Just pray. Talk to God. Maybe that's in your car ride. Maybe that's why you're taking a shower. Maybe that's why you're laying there trying to go to sleep. Maybe that's the first thing you do in the morning. Talk to God. Have a plan. Maybe it's using these RLCM meditations, and you just turn on Spotify, and you start one of those, and let us guide you through talking to God, to literally exhaling, inhaling, and breathing in the Word of God. But you've got to decide, I, I can't have trust and worry. I can't have them both. I'm going to have one or the other, and I want to go with trust. I want to be more like hummingbird than buzzard. I want to see what's good, and I can't do that on my own. So I'm putting it all in God's hands. So we're going to start by doing that right now. I want to ask you right now just to uh, close your eyes wherever you are. If you're driving, don't. But if, 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 you're, <laughs> if you're in the room, you're outside, or just, just take a moment. And just close your eyes. And I'm just going to read this scripture over you again, and I'm going to lead you through doing it. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. 
So with your eyes closed, in this moment of prayer, I want you to think about whatever it is that you worry about the most. Visualize it in your hands right now, and let's make a fist. That's what you worry about so much. It could be your health, it could be your kids, it could be your future, it could be uh, your marriage, it could be um, finances, just whatever it is. Hold that in your hands. And then I want you just to think about what is it you can do about this? God, I, I know what I can do, and I, I'm going to do my part. I am going to do my part. But here's what I can't do. I can't control the outcome. I can't control another person. And then right now, I want you just to open up your hands and trust God no matter what. God, I'm going to trust you with everything I got. God, it's all yours. You know I'm worried about my kids, but you love them even more than I do. You know I'm worried about my job and my career, but God, I know that you have a plan for me. God, you know that I'm worried about my health, but, but, but you can do miracles. And I'm going to do my part. I'm going to trust you no matter what. God, there are so many here right now. We, we've all come in with something we're carrying around with us. That box feels enormous, all the worries and cares of this life. And God, we want to, we just want to hand those over to you right now. We cannot do it. And so God, over these next few moments, would you just bring a supernatural kind of peace right now on everybody who's watching this or is a part of this right now? May we discover something that we, we've never known before because we decided to trust you that you're going to guard our hearts and our minds. We won't always get the circumstances we want, but we're, you're, going to, you're going to guard our hearts and our minds. So God, would you guide us through these next few moments? We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.